Okay, tonight's program is catch what? <laughs> He'll straighten me out. <laughs> enjoy. Or was he enjoy? Um, Dr. Uh, Simon Heinz is the director of the Institute of Resounds. Re Resonance. What does that mean? Vibration, sound. Okay. In Boulder, Colorado. Uh, the Institute is devoted to the study of subtle energy sciences, including remote viewing, crop circles, and related subjects. Dr. Heinz has we'll a PhD up, in sociology and has previously taught research methods, methodology at Washington State University. And uh, it goes on here, but he can he can tell us. He's also an author, and he has some books over here to um, uh, for you to consider. Uh, Dark Matters Monsters, Black Sway Ghosts. Swan, Black Swan. Uh, opening Minds and yes. Planetary Intelligence 101. Yes. So anyway, uh, um, we've been looking forward to having... Uh, Thanks a lot, David. Uh, Simon here, so you can take it away then. Thank you very much, David. And uh, yes, let's turn on the projector here. There you go. Let's see. Warming up again. Well, thanks very much, David, and thanks for having me here tonight. Uh, it looks like it's a, a lot of interest in this topic, and it's a real honor to uh, it's a real honor to give you a presentation here because uh, it was you know a couple decades ago I got my PhD at WSU, and I've never talked about this topic in this area before. But it turns out that this part of the inland Northwest has a good share of Bigfoot, Sasquatch activity sightings. And uh, I'm going to show you, read you some of those sightings. Some of them are just a few miles from here, oh, over the decades. It's not like it happens all the time. But if you look at the, re at the uh, reports, it happens in this area from time to time. It happens in the entire uh, Northwest in fact, throughout the United States. So let's see, we need to get some signal here. So uh, so David wrote to me a couple of months ago. He said, you know, it'd be great to have a talk about Sasquatch and Troy. And as it turns out, there, there are sightings around here. There are sightings throughout this entire area. And uh, uh, let me tell you how I got involved in this topic because it's, it's actually, for me, it's kind of a new topic too. Uh, I, I, my PhD from WCU is in sociology. And I, back when I got my degree, I, I didn't have any interest in this topic. But sociologists do study something called hidden events. Hidden events are things that people experience that they don't want to talk about because they're afraid of ostracism or ridicule or, uh, you know, getting fired from their job or for whatever reason. The, the reason that pilots, uh, and we've heard a lot about this on the news recently, pilots don't like to report UFOs, commercial pilots, military pilots, because it's not good for your promotional hearing whenever that comes around. I mean, anything can affect your promotional hearing. Having talked to lots of pilots from civilian pilots, military pilots, and this is something you're thinking about years ahead. So, in sociology, we look at these sort of uh, impediments, these sort of structural reasons why people don't like to say what they see, because it could affect them in some way later on. And the Bigfoot topic is a lot like this, because if you start investigating it like I have in the past few years, uh, you'll find that people will approach you and tell you their stories and they may never have told their stories to anyone ever before, but they feel like at least you're crazy enough to share their story with, you know, your secret safe with them. So they tell you these stories. So uh, Ron Westrom was a sociologist uh, who studied this and uh, it doesn't even have to be rare events. And the classic example before we go into the Bigfoot topic is just the subject of child abuse, which wasn't considered real until the 1960s, there had to be a series of national meetings between law enforcement and pediatricians 
and therapists and so forth to actually radiologists looking at, at bones and broken bones to actually agree that this wasn't being caused by kids falling out of trees or, or bullies or thin bone structure. This is what the excuse was back before 1962 or so. And no one wanted to confront parents. So this is sort of the classic example of hidden events. It's not just paranormal and topics that we consider to be, you know, uh, on the fringe. It could be ordinary topics that we just uh, don't feel comfortable talking about. And that was the case with child abuse until 65, when all of a sudden there were a couple of meetings held, it became real, and it was a real diagnosis. So when we're going to talk about this topic over the next hour, just think about the fact that witnesses may not feel comfortable coming forward because at this time in our society, uh, we don't have a consensus of whether this is real or not, just uh, the same way we're hearing about UFOs and congressional hearings and so forth. Now, the first contact I had with this subject was Grover Krantz at WSU. Grover Krantz happened to be one floor above me at... Uh, in uh, Wilson Hall. Uh, he was in the anthropology department and I was in sociology. I didn't know Grover Krantz. I had friends who knew Grover. They would go over to his house. He gave them some really huge footprints like a fellow here was sharing with us a few minutes ago before most of you came in. And uh, I might have passed him in the hall way or in the elevator. We were only one floor apart. Uh, but Grover was the first person in the United States, the first academic, right here at WSU to study the subject of Bigfoot seriously. There were prints around here. These were probably from Blue Mountains, just 100 miles away from us. Uh, the Walla Walla area, Umatilla National Forest. And Grover believed that this was a relic primate, that this was a Gigantopithecus. Relative. Now, Gigant Gigantopithecus, the only thing that's ever been found from Gigantopithecus, first there were some teeth found, and then these jawbones. One jawbone was found in China in the 50s. This creature lived 3 million years ago to 300,000 years ago. There's no evidence it ever came to North America and it didn't stand up. But, you know, you have to imagine the mindset of Grover in the 80s arguing to his colleagues this is real, this would be a plausible way to argue that maybe there is a relic primate, right? That this is some sort, Bigfoot is a relative of the giant apes. And it had crossed over the Bering Straits, and maybe what we were seeing here in North America was Gigantopithecus. And I want to show you over the course of the next hour why that seems increasingly less likely. But this was the idea, and I think Jeff Meldrum down at Idaho State University still studies this in Pocatello. I think this is sort of his idea, that this is more of a, a primate that, you know, is from ancient times and sort of co-exists co with us, that they're rare, but sometimes, you know, we see them. And uh, so it would just be like an animal. And you're probably all familiar with the Patty footage from the Patterson-Gimlet footage. Most of you have seen this somewhere along the line. So this was taken in 1967 by Patterson and Gimlin, two cowboys from Yakima, sort of in our neck of the woods, not too far away. Uh, Roger Patterson was a rodeo guy, but he had an interest in Bigfoot. And they decided to go down where footprints had been found in the Bluff Creek area of Northern California and had been out there on horseback for a couple of days and were in about 35 miles in from the road, according to Bob Gimlin, who I've seen a number of times at conferences. He's in his 90s now and he still, he still shows up at conferences. Uh, and they got about a minute of footage of this creature that we call Patty. You'll notice that she's not walking on all fours, she's walking upright. And um, this is sort of a model of what her face would have looked like. And there is actually a good movie about this uh, that Jeff Meldrum had something to do with. You can see this on YouTube, by the way, Sasquatch. Uh, let me use this pointer. Legend meets science. So the arguments in favor of Patty is Peter Green, a researcher from the Dallas, Oregon, went down to Disney in 1967 with this film. 
And they were the best costume makers on the planet at the time. They said, <laughs> we can't do this. Um, there's no zippers, and if you're going to make costumes, you certainly wouldn't take the time to make a female costume because that's a lot of extra work, you know, to add in breasts and so forth. Why female? Oh, because they're breasts. You can see it in the movie. Oh. And, and there's also a hematoma here. This is just one photo from it. Right here, like a wound. And so no one's ever been able to debunk this. I'm not here tonight to prove to you that this is real, but there's no evidence. <laughs> no one's ever, uh, Gimlin and Patterson, they've never changed their story. You can watch interviews with Bob Gimlin. He's a very authentic guy. Uh, these were people, they did not have a lot of money. They would not have had the resources to create a world-class costume like that. So anyone who's in this field of Bigfoot research believes this is real, from Grover Kranz to Jeff Meldrum and anyone else. I don't know anyone who doesn't think that this is actually real footage of a creature. And uh, I actually happened to see this in the 70s uh, as a preview to a movie. It was like a short documentary, like one of those short 10 minute documentaries. So this is sort of the film taken on 16 millimeter uh, camera that kind of started it all and I was listening to an interview with Bob Gimlin just earlier today uh, that came across my YouTube feed, and he said it was the most painful thing ever because his wife worked in Yakima at the Savings and Loan Bank there, one of the banks, and they got ridiculed for 35 years because of this. They, he didn't make any money off it, and it was just no end of grief. So if you think people would deliberately fake something like this, you know, think again. So this... Do you think that this is a, some sort of large ape or not? So this is Patterson and uh, Gimlin and Patterson. Again, two just ordinary cowboy guys. Patterson had an interest in this, and he actually ends up writing the first book that's ever written about Bigfoot. And you can still find this. It's Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist? And it's just a book, if you take a look at it, there's like seven incarnations of this book. He actually wrote this before the Patty sighting, uh, so he had an interest in this. It's sort of a, a type of book a cowboy would write. It's full of very interesting news articles and clippings from the Bluff Creek area and newspaper articles from the 50s and 60s supporting the idea that this sort of creature exists. And this is actually based on real cases because Sasquatch and dogs do not get along well. If you didn't know this already, <laughs> they tend not to get along very well at all. Need a dog. <laughs> they, dogs tend to run away and hide under your bed when these things are around. Uh, the first name of Bigfoot comes from this guy, Jerry Crew, in Bluff Creek. That's how they found out about it, 58. They were a road crew. They were building roads along Bluff Creek, and they found these footprints. They had huge, you know... Uh, 100-gallon oil uh, drums thrown over, van, you know, sort of vandalism to their site. And, he, and, and Crew was really ticked off about this because it was slowing down their work project. Anyway, he's the one who coined the name Bigfoot. And that's where we got from Jerry Crew. So there is a really interesting book about this area I came across when I was visiting a friend in Walla Walla a couple of years ago. It's called Bigfoot of the Blues by Vance Orchard, who was a local newspaper reporter in the Tri-Cities area. If you can find a copy of this, it's well worth reading because he talks about WSU, Grover Krantz, sort of the people that were interested. Apparently, there was even a Bigfoot conference held at WSU in 1989. I, 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 first time I ever heard about it. Uh, you all know where this forest is. We're up here, like right? And this is a big... Sasquatch area. I know people from Seattle that come out here to look for Sasquatch. This is how much of a hot spot it is. Even today, people are still having sightings and hearing things and getting footprints in this area. The Blue Mountains actually extend all the way down to central Oregon. Here, but this is the area where there's just been a lot of activity. Again, it's not very far away from this. And, and Vince Orchard documents this in his book, Bigfoot of the Blues. It's about this attempt to find one, to, to, to kill one, to bring one in as proof, you know. And they had a lot of sightings, but they never could capture one because they're just extremely elusive. The famous Paul Freeman footage was filmed right there. 
uh, near Walla Walla. And I'm going to show you a clip of this. Paul Freeman was a Forest Service worker who started in the 80s. He saw the tracks around. He was His job was to, I think, protect the Walla Walla watershed. You know, these are the areas where they don't want people to go in because of the water. And uh, it's like a reservoir for the cities in that area. So he's out there one day, and he captures this creature. And let's see if we can take a look at his video. He had a video camera that was uh, what people would have had at the time. <laughs> so you could see that, right? It's yeah. right back there. Now again, get up here where I'm seeing you. Let's play it again. There's oh, his son just recently wrote a book about this. You see much up there? About here. Paul Freeman's life. He passed away. But brush popping and stuff. Is it looking front of the front there? See. Oh, there you go. Pretty big. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, so according to... Get up here where I'm sitting. Get up there. Get better. Better picture. Yeah, so... Um, um. Yeah, so that's the Paul Freeman footage, and uh, we can look at it again afterwards. Yeah, so Paul was fired from the Forest Service because of this. And if you listen to Forest Service workers, they are not allowed to talk about this. I have listened to interviews with Forest Service workers based out of U of I, Lewiston, who go back into the Orofino area, and have had encounters like this, you know, all sorts of encounters, and they've been told point blank, if you talk about this, you're going to lose your job within 24 hours. It's that serious. So if you're wondering why we don't hear more about these sort of encounters, again, for me as a sociologist, I'm not trying to tell you this is proof positive, but that's a good reason why people wouldn't be talking about it. The very people that would have the most contact with this sort of creature is because... We don't know why the Forest Service doesn't want to talk about it. Same thing with the National Park Service. Uh, park rangers who see this, uh, Bob Action Jackson from Yellowstone was not rehired after being vocal about his sightings. He patrolled the sort of north territory of Yellowstone to keep poachers out coming in from Montana. And he encountered them a bunch of times. He said, you know, two legs, definitely not a bear. And he was also not rehired. So the, the Park Service says, you know, the green and brown, we don't want to scare people. Maybe that's the motivation. Maybe they don't want people deserting our national parks and forests. But uh, there's a lot of uh, people that are loggers and Forest Service workers have a lot of contact with it. But there's just a lot more evidence than that. And it has to do with the number of uh, the evidence from Native Americans. This is somebody I met, Neil at the Forks Washington conference. I went out there because, and I'll show you this at the end, there was a movie that came out about Bigfoot, Flash of Beauty, Paranormal Bigfoot, and they wanted me to be there at the screening. Neil got up and said, you know, my grandfather used to trade with Sasquatch, and he's a member of the Spokane tribe. So I went up to him afterwards. I said, well, well, Neil, what, what, when, and what did you trade? He goes, the last time his grandfather said it happened was 1913 a little over 100 years ago. I said, what did they trade? He goes, my grandfather was a salmon fisherman. They would trade uh, salmon for medicinal. The Sasquatch would come down once a year. And they thought of them as another tribe. Not a great ape. They said it was just a very distant tribe, kind of someone. And if you look at the Native American, uh, most tribes, m the majority of tribes have a name for Sasquatch. There are hundreds of Native American names for Sasquatch. And they have all different ideas. I've talked to many of them about what it meant to them. And there's just a whole range of feelings about Sasquatch. The, the Lumi, the Quinault, and the Maka from 
the West Coast Olympic Peninsula also traded with Sasquatch. And uh, Dave Polites, who you probably have heard of, who's done a lot of research in Bigfoot, in his book, uh, I'll show it to you in a second, uh, Bigfoot, Wild Men, and some, something else, they held a press conference in 1924. Someone had had a, in Oregon, had had an encounter with Bigfoot, and the sheriff wanted to go out and form a posse and go get him. And three tribes held a press conference in 24, said, don't hurt them, we trade with them. So this idea of trading with Sasquatch is something that's pretty deep in our history, Native American history. It's not something to be easily dismissed. Uh, this is a drawing from the Thule Indians in uh, California. kind of looks <laughs> like something Sasquatch. -like. So the Native American tribes talked about Sasquatch as something real. T.J. Ravenwolf, who's someone I met as part of the movie, who's in Flash of Beauty Part 1, Bigfoot Revealed, and the, the, the sequel. I got to talk to him, and he's from Alaska, from the Tine tribe in central Alaska. And he told me, while he actually hadn't seen Sasquatch, they had a name for it, which they, he wouldn't repeat, because it had this aura around it, an aura of fear. And he told me they took it very seriously up there, and they were very serious to avoid them. Up in Alaska, they called them woodsmen or bushmen, and they were not to be messed with, okay? They weren't like the ones down here that could be hospitable and cooperative. They were just a whole different type, and you didn't want to mess with them. And I asked TJ, uh, he lives over in Vancouver, Washington. I said, well, what were they to you? He goes, again, a distant tribe, just a very distant tribe that wasn't that you really didn't want to uh, deal with too much. But some of the tribes in the U.S. felt that they were like protectors of the forest, that they had sort of a sacred status. But others uh, were incredibly fearful of them. The Spokane Indians called them men stealers. And a lot of the Northwest Coast Native Americans would talk about the Sasquatch coming in once a year to steal uh, women and children. This is not a joke. So. There's just a whole range of experiences with Native Americans and Sasquatch, and it's something that you can look up and uh, decide for yourself. When I was talking to someone from the Navajo tribe a couple summers ago on a Bigfoot adventure weekend in the Colorado area, I asked him what their word for Sasquatch was. He said, huge monster. And just like a lot of other tribes, they would tell the kids, don't make a lot of noise when you, if you go out of the Hawan at night. A lot of tribes had this story, and, and our culture interpreted that as, well, they're just trying to scare the kids to come back home early. But Alonzo from uh, Arizona told me, uh, no, no, it wasn't just to scare people. It was really to keep you, uh, keep you safe. So, Sasquatch is not just associated with a, a huge, hairy biped. Stan Gordon, who's someone I've talked to many times, interviewed twice on my YouTube channel, which I'll show you how to watch at the end if you're interested. He started out actually as a UFO researcher in Pennsylvania in 1959, before I was even born. And I'm kind of old at this point. So he goes back even older. He was just working with the Westinghouse UFO Club, which was engineers at the end of the day, just interested in the subject. He was the phone kid. They needed a phone kid to answer the phone. He was 10 years old. And he said around 1965, before Patterson-Gimlin film, people would start saying they were seeing a hairy biped along with the UFOs. This is something we cannot completely understand. You can listen to my interviews with Stan or read his books. It goes along with the territory. More traditional researchers like Grover Krantz and Jeff Meldrum would not want to hear anything about UFOs being associated with Bigfoot because it was just enough to try to argue that Bigfoot was even real. But this is what researchers encounter around areas where UFO sightings, you get things like Bigfoot and either other types of creatures that we're even less familiar with. Uh, the supernatural aspect of Bigfoot also goes back a long way. Native Americans have always talked about this, and there was a saying from the Miwok Indians, I believe in California, that wherever a Bigfoot walks, a lantern follows, which we think means something like an orb or ball lightning like that. But even Fred Beck in this, you might have heard about this, the Tack and Ape Canyon in Mount Rainier uh, uh, 
1924, it was five miners in a cabin, and they said they were attacked by these ape men, which we think are like Sasquatch. You can actually read about this online. His entire book is online for you to read. And the interesting thing about what Fred Beck said is that there were other aspects of it that were kind of strange. A sense of a supernatural presence, objects sort of appearing and disappearing. This is something that most anthropologist researchers, the couple that actually do study Bigfoot, that there's like all three of them, do not want to go into that territory because it's already, you're already going on, on a limb as it is to argue that Sasquatch is real. Uh, but this is what people report around Sasquatch encounters is sense of time loss sometimes, objects moving around and, and things like this. And it goes back to 1924 and uh, Native American stories about Sasquatch um, also. So there was someone at the Forks Washington Conference that found the cabin where this took place. You could always wonder, did this really happen? Uh, Mark Mysell, I believe his name was. Uh, he found the cabin, he found the shell casings. Everything that Fred Beck ha said happened there, they found in the evidence in this area around this cabin uh, in Mount Rainier, uh, what's still left of it. So this event really did happen, and it's something you can research if you're interested in. Dave Pilates, who you probably know more from Missing 411, actually started out before he was interested in missing persons as a Bigfoot researcher. And he's written some excellent books. They're really worth reading if you want some detail because these books, every single witness had to sign an affidavit. Pilates, former, former you know, law enforcement officer from California, he had them all sign affidavits that what they said to him was the truth. And there is just, he had Harvey Pratt, who's a forensic artist from Oklahoma, from the state police in Oklahoma, do these beautiful sketches. And they are just the most incredible detailed drawings of Sasquatch in the Hoopa uh, Reservation uh, in Northern California, uh, not far from Bluff Creek, by the way, uh, Trinity River area, Trinity Mountains. Uh, so first he did the Hoopa Project and then Tribal Bigfoot. And these are extremely detailed witness accounts from Native Americans that live on either the, the, the Hoopa Reservation or other reservations that they looked at. And he also wrote this book, Bigfoot, Wild Men, and Giants, which looks at newspaper articles going back to 1680. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's been in North America has been talking about Bigfoot, Wild Men. They didn't call it Bigfoot. They called them Wild Men, Mountain Devils, uh, Giants. It seems to be all the same sort of thing. Even the Vikings, when they landed in, is it Newfoundland, talked about encountering tall, screaming, giant bipeds. So we think that the Vikings also encountered what we call Bigfoot today. But if you read, uh, and, and he, Pilates has an excellent YouTube channel, and he had a 21 or 22 series uh, class, about an hour long each video, on Bigfoot. And it's really, it's completely free. If you're interested, I would advise you to go to his Missing 411 channel and go to Bigfoot 101. Highly detailed, uh, you know, witness reports going through article after article, like cowboys encounter Native Americans. I mean, people have been encountering this creature for hundreds of years. And it seems like we have memory loss, like each generation keeps forgetting this and then we're rediscovering it again. But it's been around for hundreds of years as Pilates uh, documents. Um, another good source of this is Ron Moorhead. Moorhead went up into the Sierra Nevadas just uh, on a hunting expedition in the 70s. I've interviewed him uh, once, and I've seen him recently up in uh, Kalispell at the Montana Mystery Hunt. We got to talk again. He had nine expeditions, and he recorded these things called the Sierra Sounds. Have you heard of the Sierra Sounds? Have you? Because I'm about to play them in a second. And if you scare easily, you might not want to see. Uh, they never could see what is making the sounds I'm going to play for you. We can't understand it. They brought up skeptics, Al Berry, to try to disprove this. The skeptics said it was real. And what I'm about to play for you was, uh, has been analyzed by linguists who work for the Navy, Scott Nelson, 
and what they concluded from these recordings. They heard them and they said, we have to record this. They came back up eight miles up to this hunting camp that they built themselves up in the Sierra Nevadas. Eight miles by horse, steep. Uh, they concluded that the Sasquatch can talk while they're inhaling, not just while they're exhaling like we do. That they have a broader vocal range than we do and it's just a much deeper vocal structure. So he's written these books, Voices in the Wilderness, Quantum Bigfoot, and a new one I just saw this today from a couple of days ago, Bigfoot in Unveiled, which I haven't read yet. But Moorhead is one of the best witnesses we know about. Uh, he's a great guy, and uh, he said you couldn't see them, you know, you could hear them. It was like they were next to you. You'd go around the hunting structure, couldn't see anything. So let me just play you some of these Sierra sounds, and again, uh, I will try to make this not too loud since Biggie, uh, Biggie is really loud. So hold on one second. Let's see. So this is going to start out. This is starting out with the famous. This is the wood knocking sounds that people have heard. It's been heard around here, as I'll show you. No one knows if this is them hitting a tree. It's, that's what people think it is, but it's never been seen. What creates these knocking, huge, loud knocking sounds? Now keep in mind, this is eight miles from a road on horseback up in the middle of the road. And then Ron tried to imitate him, which he thinks now is a dumb idea because he doesn't know what they're saying. But he's going to try to talk back to them. There are no roads anywhere near this eight miles high. Someone can just drive up there and pull a break. <laughs> so. Then they got sounds that were a lot. Now he was just imitating them back, but again, he told me recently he didn't know what they were saying. It could have been, you know, hostile or something. <laughs> but here is now. This is a recording. This is right outside the hunting structure. This is going to sound really weird, but this is they put. I asked him. They put mics into the wood. They were on the other side of the structure. They could hear this right on the other side, and. Um, uh, this is what they recorded. It was two Sasquatch having an argument. They weren't sure what they were arguing about, except maybe who gets to go in and eat the humans first. But it sounds really nasty, and again, we don't know. Scott Nelson said, the Navy linguist, this is a language. We don't know what they're saying. They're listening to this on the other side of the wall. They did put food out there as bait. Maybe this has something to do with it. I asked Ron if they, in nine visits, did they ever see me once at a very far distance, the typical, like Paul Freeman, and was gone. But this is, you would go out and not see what was making this sound. They have five, four or five guys up here at a time. So. Now, if you talk to if you talk to Sasquatch witnesses and they say I heard them talking, they if you play this for me, they say it sounded like that. It's a very some people say it sounds like a Tasmanian devil crossed with a samurai, reverse samurai. So it's there's things like syllables in the speech, but no one's ever been able to decipher what what it could mean. We just know it's a, it, it's, it resembles human speech in some way.
So they got hours and hours of this. If you look up Sierra Sound, you can, uh, you can hear more of it. Trying to make sense of what it is. Very staccato. So the Bigfoot range of speech, it is, it's vast. They seemingly can imitate any animal sound that they want to. And what people have often mm. described it as, it sounds like two owls communicating, but the owls sound too big. Or two coyotes communicating, but something's a little off. Just sounds a little too big and not quite right. And this is what I've heard from talking to witnesses many times is, uh, it sounds like animals, but it doesn't sound quite right. So they can imitate animals, they can imitate birds, and they can imitate you. They can imitate you calling for your dog. This seems to be the creepiest thing, is you can hear your house, yourself calling for your dog when you're in your house. I was recently interviewing a witness who we called Steve from uh, Southern California who had been up to this area in the Sierra Nevadas, and he said they had different instruments, including an Australian didgeridoo. And at 3 a.m., when they're all in their tents, they heard a didgeridoo coming back from the far. So some people say it's like they have a hard drive in their chest and they can just record any sound, and they're like ventriloquists. Uh, the Native Americans said this too. So let's go back to the slides again. Um, so if you're interested, look up the Sierra Sounds Ron's book, Books are really good. Again, he concluded this is not just some sort of relic primate, that this is, he called it a quantum Bigfoot. Um, uh, it, it's just they seem to have a, abilities that we can't really understand very easily, including invisibility, uh, interesting ability to project fear, uh, but like they turned on a switch. Someone I know very well who, uh, who's had an encounter when she was uh, in Indiana as a nine-year-old said, it was almost like it, she didn't feel afraid at first, but she saw it picking berries at the end of the road. It was white-haired, Marionville, Indiana. Uh, and all, all of a sudden the fear just turned on, and then when it left, it turned off. And a lot of people have described this aspect to it. It's sort of like a projected, directed energy. Uh, her parents said she probably saw a neighbor in a fur suit in July, but she didn't think so. So... Um, Igor Burtsev was one of the first people I ran into at a conference in Bailey, Colorado. He's a Russian researcher who's been studying Bigfoot for 50 years, you know, way back. Former political scientist, part of, you know, got his degree when the Soviet Union was still the Soviet Union. And he told us at first in the Russia, Soviet Union, they thought the same thing. Relic primate, then they realized, no, it has speech, it, it, it's too intelligent for a, to be a primate. It was probably a relic human, a humanoid or hominid, as they call them over there. They call it hominology, like some sort of human like us that we didn't know about. But once they started encountering witnesses that talked about invisibility, seeing them disappear in front of their eyes, which is very common, by the way. You won't hear people sharing this, but I've talked to many people who've said this. I've, they said, I've never told this to anyone before, but they literally saw it vanish in front of them. Uh, Igor said the same thing to us a couple of years ago. They concluded it was some sort of paranormal human. So uh, we don't totally understand it. But we know the Forest Service keeps track of this because someone who worked for the Mount Hood National Forest, and I guess I'm allowed to show you these, doesn't say classified it. She saw a Bigfoot reporting form and she took a picture of it. It says at the top, don't bother submitting joke reports or fake reports. They will not be added to the database. And here, if you work for the Forest Service, you can, uh, you can submit your reports. So it's pretty clear. And I think if you'll remember this, that the Army of Corps of Engineers, when they were building the dams along the Snake River, Columbia, and so forth, they had a whole chapter on Bigfoot in their report. 
So you can see that too. This is something I was aware of a number of years ago too. So it seems that our government agencies keep track of this, but they don't tell us about it, which is not a surprise. Uh, this is someone I ran into who runs Margie's Outdoor Store in Bingen, Washington, right near the Dells. He just started this, at take up, took over his mom's store, turned it into an outdoor store, and he had people coming in reporting all sorts of strange creatures, Bigfoot-like creatures and other ones. I've interviewed him twice, and he's, you can listen to the interviews, the types of things people encounter out there uh, in the Columbia Basin down by the Dells. So he set up a uh, reporting station, and if you have a sighting around this area, around Bingen, you can go in on the laptop, and, and he has thousands of reports now, people seeing things, Bigfoot-like things, and, and other creatures that we really don't have names for. Smaller ones, the Native Americans called the smaller people the Bugwas. At least some of them did. Uh, they said those were the ones to really watch out for. Forget Bigfoot, it was the little people. People, he, he's told me that people have seen these uh, repeatedly in that area. So he's someone in this area, or at least, you know, farther to the west who keeps track of this. So the reports I want to tell you about now are sightings in this area, which actually I was really surprised when I first started studying this a couple of years ago. I mean, the way I got involved with this personally, since I did not study this at WSU and I did not know Grover Krantz, I mean, this started with me with a friend giving me Bigfoot socks as a gift. And she said there was this store in Bailey, Colorado, a, a museum, the Sasquatch Outpost. And I just happened to pass it one day, coming back from Southern Colorado. And there it was, and I went in, and I couldn't believe that there were all these sightings just along the Front Range. I live in Boulder most of the time, and people had seen tree structures. This is one thing to watch for, odd-looking teepee structures, which you may think Boy Scouts have built, but they didn't. And footprints and so forth. So this sort of got me into looking, well, how common are these sightings? If you go to the BFRO.net site, you can look by state. This is just a fraction of all the sightings that are out there. They don't include anything weird in these reports. They don't want that. They just want, what did you see? They don't want about orbs and missing time or anything like that, which we'll talk about in a moment. But they do have every state. And if you look here, you can break it down. And for Idaho, look, there is Lata uh, County. And you can see that we've every state in the United States has these sightings. I've even heard stories from Hawaii of people encountering mountain people up there, tall mountain people that could be Sasquatch. So Lata County, right around us, has had six official sightings, and uh, I just wanted to read to you a few of what these were. Uh, oh, let's take a look at this again. So, where have they happened? Uh, there have been a number south of the rest stop uh, on 95, you know, right there, coming into Potlatch. Mm -hmm. uh, the most recent one actually was this woman. Maybe you know who this is from 2017. She said she saw a red-haired one chasing deer at uh, mile post 267 or something, just a couple yeah. miles south of the rest of I, I'm friends with the cop that interviewed her. Okay, so tell us. They went out and looked for tracks. They did. Yeah. But where it crossed up on the hill was pretty rocky. Couldn't really find it. And she said she hit the deer because she was distracted by looking in well, the... There's a lot going she on. Missed, she missed the deer, but she went to look in her mirror, you know, when she hit the brake yeah. lights and just lit this thing up and it had a deer under its arm. Yeah, that's right. Thing. And so her husband, the reason she was going back, traveling to Moscow was to pick her husband up because yep. his rig was in the shop. Got it. Well, she completely forgot about picking him and just drove right to the cop shop. That's right. In <laughs> Pollock. He her guts and just, he, he said she was so wound up, she seen something. She yeah. saw something. This is... Yeah, so this is the report. You can read it right there. But we heard it from, what, what was your name? Uh, Jim Weatherford. Jim. So Jim told us this is the story from 2017. And it turned out there was another sighting there a couple years later, a woman said she saw one cross at 2 a.m. 
uh, across the road and it, she should have been able to see it in the field just uh, by Wiegand Private Road. Now this sighting happened by Brinken Road, but the next sighting was just a mile south of there at Wiegand Private and she said she should have seen it, but it, it was gone. And when she got home, her dog was like really upset just being around her, which was really unusual. It's almost like the, the vibe, as Jim is telling us, she was so wound up that even the, the dog could see it. Uh, so um, let me take, let me read you just a couple of these other reports from the area. Uh, this one was from 2020 in Beauville. Now this is just, if you read these, it is very typical of uh, what people said. He, he's a disabled veteran. He's been hunting in this area a long time. And he heard the wood knocking sounds. On you, some of you probably know what road this is. It's a dead end road south of Beauville. And he, he had been hunting there for decades. He hears the wood knocking sounds. He gets a little afraid. It goes silent. Now, this is one of the typical aspects of a Sasquatch encounter, which leads me to believe that there's an electromagnetic component is birds will stop chirping. Crickets will stop chirping. It'll just go really silent. He noticed this, says, okay, I'm not afraid of anything. He puts a couple slugs in his shotgun, starts walking towards the wood knock sound, and feels like he should turn around and go the other way, which he does. And he says he hasn't been back there since. I had another friend in this area that had walked there, too, and she said she got a very strange feeling all of a sudden with her dog and turned around. So this is sort of typical of... Now, i got to tell you something about BFRO. People, they're, they're trained researchers that interview every single one of these witnesses. You can't just make something up for BFRO. They're going to send someone out or call you, and they're going to want to hear every detail. So these are all stories where the, these people have been vetted, and the researcher, uh, uh, the researcher uh, you know, talked to them about it. So that, that's a very interesting story just over in Beauville. This one was from 63 up in Moscow Mountain. Nearest town, Troy. Oh, thought we were joking about this, David, huh? No, they're Troy. This is a very strange story. His dad was a logger. He had leased some land up there to log. He tells the kid, oh, just go have some fun. And the kid starts, they both feel like they're being watched. And the dad said, it's probably a bear in the area, a bear cub. The kid starts climbing a tree, and he says, a chimpanzee climbed up the tree with him. Chimpanzee, definitely a chimp. That's what he thought as an eight-year-old. Climbs all the way up the tree, this far away from him, and then just keeps going up. And they noticed that the cattle in the area were extremely agitated. And other people, people they knew in the area, said the, cow, the cattle were extremely agitated up there, like something had been bugging them. So the dad thinks, oh, there must be a chimp uh, loose. A lot of people think like the escaped gorilla theory. And they started calling around to see if there had been any circuses on the Palouse, and there hadn't been. So years later, this kid says, uh, it had to have been a baby Sasquatch, because there are no chimps in Idaho forest that we know about, but you'll often hear people will say it was like an escaped gorilla. But how many escaped gorillas are there in the U.S.? It's more likely to be a Sasquatch. So this is a, a, just another very, and you look how long and the amount of detail here. Uh, and, uh, the dad said he was always armed when he went out after that, in case they encountered the chimp. Here's the, the, the cattle turning wild on people. So uh, that's just, I, I measured where this would be just like five miles from here. But again, going back way to 63. Uh, let's see, what about this one? Uh, this is coming down White Pine Drive from St. Mary's to Potlatch in uh, 2004. Uh, people said in the car that they saw a green and black figure uh, cross the road in front of them on White Pine Drive on two legs with, with shaggy, uh, head was shaggy, couldn't see the face. Uh, and this is what they say, which is so common. It crossed the road in two steps. You know, typical state highway, not like we would cross, just big steps. So this is how we know that it's a Sasquatch type report. And let's see. Uh, this is one from 2005. Uh, I think this is near Idler's Rest or maybe another area like that. These were people visiting the area 
They thought it was a very big person and their dog, but as these creatures walked towards them, they realized they were both walking on two legs. They couldn't be there. And this is a very long report. You can visit B. I'm just showing this to you because you can visit BFRO and look in your area, if it's not Lake Tall County, read these, how detailed they are. Uh, and people are so puzzled. Tall, dark figure. I mean, it just doesn't sound like anything that we can easily explain goes on and on. So th these are just some of the encounters. Uh, the other encounter by the rest stop on 95, the woman did say that she had an experience out. Same thing kind of like the Beauville Hunter at Jerry Johnson Hot Springs on Route 12 a couple of years before because the BFRO investigator said, have you ever had anything like this happen before? This is the woman coming down, sees it cross the road, and her dog's really upset when she gets back. 2 a.m. she wakes up her family, kind of like Jim saying, that's really wound up. The investigator said, did you ever have this happen before? And she said, well, and we were at Jerry Johnson Hot Springs, and it just went suddenly quiet, and we got our really bad feeling, and we left. We don't know if this is, an, you know, Bigfoot intentionally trying to make people leave an area or actually how they do it, but it's very consistent with the reports of the sounds they make. Because if you listen to these reports, their scream can be so loud, people say it's like the loudest sound they ever heard in their life. It's almost something that could perforate your eardrums. The, the scream, the howl, growl. Some people say it sounds like a Tyrannosaurus Rex turning to, into a pterodactyl. It's an ear-piercing scream. You can't miss it. It's like being at a rock concert in front of the speakers and feeling your internal organs vibrate ever been at a loud rock concert now here's the weird thing about it you could have people in the same campground who didn't hear it and i've heard this a number of times people said it was louder than a freight train and they went to the other people just 100 feet away said did you hear that and the people didn't hear it. so this leads me to think that uh this is actually uh, like a very developed type almost like a technology it's like a directed energy resonance that they can focus towards you. I don't think it's just telepathic because people say they feel their body vibrating, but it's directed. And I imagine the Sasquatch would use this to hunt because if you can direct it at your prey, you know, you could paralyze them, you could make them, you know, feel afraid enough that they would freeze up as most humans do when, when the Sasquatch get really close. So those are some reports from our area. Uh, so I don't think David realized so some of the phenomena that we see around Sasquatch, which led me to write my book, Dark Matter Monsters, which is, this doesn't seem at all like a relic primate. <laughs> Not in, I mean, it's hairy and it's big. And people do say it looked a little bit like a human versus ape, but you also get people saying it looked like a caveman and not like an ape or a cross between an ape and a cat. Um, by the way, James Shubsky, I showed you his photo before from Margie's Outdoor Store in Bingen, Washington. He told me about the click -tat ape cat. Have you heard about the click -tat ape cat? There's been over 60 sightings of this huge black cat, which has an ape-like face. So my feeling is that there's a lot more than Sasquatch out there. If we're to believe people like James and you read books from uh, Stan Gordon and others. It just people generally don't talk about it for fear of ridicule. That's my point of view on this. Is this is probably happening forever, more than we thought. Even if you go back to the Bible, you hear references to giants, the Nephilim, the Raphaim. This is probably all real. It's just something about our culture that doesn't feel comfortable talking about it. The types of phenomena you get around Bigfoot, which really piqued my interest, which really takes it out of the realm of being any sort of ordinary, even rare, ancient animal, is the sudden quiet, which I don't think we normally get around other types of animals. Camera and battery failure. I've talked to many witnesses who said they were just about to take a picture and their camera was completely drained, their phone. Car wouldn't start. You can read stories about this just when you want to get away. Your car won't start. And they're looking in the window at you. Uh, it can be quite intimidating. And then the car, they leave, the car starts again. There's something electromagnetic about this. Orbs. Lots of light phenomena. Even uh, Ron Moorhead talked about orbs and strange light phenomena around their hunting cabin. 
One time they heard a gong-like sound just over the cabin. But he said they also saw orbs and saw something that looked like a lightsaber from Star Wars going between the trees. Um, so this really is associated with Sasquatch, is strange light phenomena, orbs. Sometimes people just see the orbs when they were expecting to see the Sasquatch or see the Sasquatch transform into an orb-like shape, which is very hard to explain. Sudden temperature changes. People often report it gets very cold right before the Sasquatch encounter, which um, is very similar to what you find around condensed matter physics and phenomena, very dense matter that changes the temperature of the room. So this is another clue we're not dealing with an ordinary sort of animal. And then mental confusion and time loss. A lot of big researchers have talked about infrasound. This is something that we know that whales <laughs> use and giraffes to communicate with other uh, of their spe other animals of their species across large distances. And uh, you can't hear it, but you can feel it. That's certainly possible with Bigfoot Sasquatch, but I think there is more involved than that because it just has an intensity to it that you don't get around giraffes or whales, and it's incapacitating. It's like this sort of sudden fear that I was talking about. People think that's infrasound, and the interesting thing about it is People say they can feel it even after the Sasquatch is gone. This sort of sense of mental confusion. And then there are people that have time loss, just like you've heard happen around UFOs. Uh, missing time. Uh, whatever you believe is doing that, you've probably heard of this, where people were in their car and then they're losing a couple hours of time. They saw a bright light. And I've written about some of that in my book, Black Swan Ghosts, because I've talked to witnesses from this area who've had that experience. Uh, that's also something that happens around Sasquatch. People will re be there, they're in barricading themselves in their trailer, in the, in the bathroom, and all of a sudden five hours have gone by and they're still standing there. Their dog is still standing next to them as if no time passed, but it's morning. Very hard to explain if this is a typical, ordinary sort of primate. <clears throat> Interesting aspects to Sasquatch, glowing eyes. People report all different colors of glowing eyes. The eyes can just turn on. It's almost like they're, they have their own night vision with their own night vision emitter. <laughs> and uh, I imagine that would be useful for hunting. Jet-like speeds. People I've talked to said when they're running at top speed, it's like a blur <laughs> between two trees. You cannot focus in on it. It's that fast. Uh, people, I've talked to a couple people about this. I said, you know, kind of like Fast animal, you know, deer or something. No, no, just they said jet like. This is the word they're using. Cloaking. This is really happens. They can seemingly disappear. When I went to the Kalispell, Montana Mystery Conference held by uh, Dave Polites and a couple other folks up there just last fall, I ran into someone, just the first person I ran into in the hotel uh, with my dog. And I just asked her, you know, hey, well, you know, what's your interest in the conference? She said, I've never been to a conference in my life. It's the first conference ever. So I said, well, what made you want to come to a conference at all? She goes, because I was on my grandparents' land north of Missoula as a teenager, and I saw my dog suddenly like, freeze up and was staring at something, and we saw this. The only way we could describe it is a juvenile Bigfoot, very you know, adolescent, dark hair, and then it digitized right in front of our eyes. I said, what did you mean digitized? She goes, pixelated. It just faded out, which is exactly what Igor Burtsev had told us from his witnesses in Russia. And if you watch the Paranormal Bigfoot film uh, that I'm in that came out last uh, December, you can see it on Amazon or Vimeo. There are witnesses saying the same sort of thing. Police officers who've seen this happen in front of their patrol cars, one of them, I'm told, went through this area after the Sasquatch. And I know this sounds really bizarre, but this is what people report. They said it went invisible in front of the squad car they were going through, and it was like going through turbulence. Like there was something there, but nothing physical. So you do get this cloaking effect, and it's been just seen by many people many times. Super loud howls, screams that it seemed to be directed in one direction, and of course rock throwing. <laughs> this is uh, These are big rocks. Uh, mostly they don't 
hit you with the rocks, they're trying to scare you away. And if you know people who've experienced this, it usually starts out as small rocks. And if you don't leave, it gets bigger. I had a friend uh, in Colorado hiking with another person in Estes Park. And she said a huge rock came between them. They were this far apart on the trail and it came right between them and knocked her friend over just from the proximity, but it didn't hurt her. And there was nobody there. Vertically, the rock came horizontally. Big, you know, bowling ball sized rock. This is reported over and over again. So you're probably wondering yourself, you know, can we believe these reports? Are they true? They are definitely consistent going back hundreds of years of these creatures being very accurate with rock. So if you're a camp somewhere and rocks start coming down on your tent at 2 a.m., this has something to do with it. So one person, I, this is just last couple slides here before we go to questions. I talked to someone that saw Bigfoot with glowing yellow eyes because I have this Bigfoot Zoom group that I just started because I met so many people with experiences. I thought it'd be fun to get together twice a month and just talk about it, which we do on Zoom. And a woman heard, was watching my YouTube channel, wrote to me, and I said, let's talk about your case. This happened in the 70s. She was on a Smithsonian archaeology expedition at China Lake Naval Weapons Station in California in the Mojave Desert. Uh, there, she had, there, she's with three guys and herself. They're split between two tents. She's going to sleep. There's a, a friend of hers on the other side of the tent, and she feels something touching her through the tent. This is more common than you would think. Uh, like a big hand touching your head. She thought it was the guy on the other side of the tent. So she said, hey, what are you doing? He goes, I'm sleeping. I'm not, not even on your side of the tent. They all, four people run out of the two tents at the same time, and they see this is, uh, this is AI in action. I had AI draw this. It's sort of close, but not exactly. She said it was more adolescent. She said it had yellow glowing eyes on a moonless night. I'm just telling you what she told me. And she said it stared at her. It wasn't looking at the guys. It stared at her for about 30 seconds, not in a malicious way, but just a stare. It's about nine feet tall. And she said it was the longest 30 seconds of her life. They all go back into one tent, back to back, until 5 a.m. They can't sleep. They say, maybe we should get out of here. And this is 10 miles off the road, by the way, on the, the, the Naval Weapons Station property where the public's not allowed. Uh, the Smithsonian had permission to be there. They all had cameras. They come out the next morning. There's a little bit of snow and huge footprints like you're familiar with. And we were looking at one earlier today. That's this, this evening, someone brought a foot, uh, big cast. And she said, nobody took a picture of it. They, she says, to this day, she can't understand why when they all had cameras and they were taking pictures of petroglyphs, they didn't take a picture of these huge footprints. Until she ran into a Native American years later who said, they can influence your mind, and she felt better about that. <laughs> so maybe that's what happened. But I mean, so I've spoken to someone that saw the glowing eyes, and yeah, there's red, there's yellow, there's blue. Yeah, I guess it's useful when you're out in the dark to have your own internal flashlight. Uh, we know that there are certain types of fish that can create phospho, you know, phospholuminescence and things, but it's another aspect of the Sasquatch phenomena are glowing eyes that can turn on and off. My personal view of this is that this is a type of exotic physics that we actually probably know about. There is the Lockheed Martin patent that's available online where they talk about coherent matter and directed energy and being able to uh, affect things at a distance. And I'm pretty sure that this is something that's really already known in some circles of science. It's probably classified. Uh, because if we're discovering it technologically, it's probably likely there are already species out there that have developed this thousands of years ago, and they're certainly not sharing their secrets with us. So for me, this is, has to do with dark matter, which, as you know, very briefly, makes up most of the matter in the universe. We don't see it. It's like the vast majority of matter is dark and invisible out there. And this could be a dark matter type of life form, which would explain the invisibility. The orbs, well, we've seen these in different places like Hestalen in Norway, I think they're the same types of orbs. It's just a very uh, different type of matter beyond what we're used to, a kind of organized, coherent matter that glows. And it would suggest that these creatures can use sound or cavitation to create states of energy, which you and I don't know how to do on our own without advanced technology. So for me, and there's Japanese researchers like Takayaki Matsumoto who've talked about different types of states of matter 
where it collapses and you get a lot of energy, it's related to cold fusion. So in my mind, going from Grover Krantz in the 80s to bring it up to date, this is a type of creature that knows how to use these types of states of matter to generate orbs, interact with orbs, create cloaking. This is all in the Lockheed Martin patent, by the way, about cloaking and invisibility. So I, I think we actually have a sense of how this actually works. It's just amazing, and I'm not even sure I can still believe it myself, that there's actually a creature out there, it could just be a few miles from us, that knows how to do this on its own, that evolved to take advantage of these various states of matter, organized states of matter that give it the ability to fade away, to create huge amounts of volume, to run at jet speeds. You know, when we look at the footprints, People say it has to weigh 600, 800,000 pounds or more because people have tried where those footprints have been found to try to make the prints and they can't do it, even jumping up and down on the soil, pushing rocks in. You can't get that depth. It's something that really weighs a lot. You would think something that's that big and weighs that much would be obvious to us and yet we don't see it. It's so elusive you might not even believe what I just showed you. You could just think, I just still don't think it exists and yet we have hundreds of years of witness reports that's extremely consistent. So I think it's another, it's a creature that has taken advantage of other states of matter and it very well could be a type of human from a long time ago that has something to do with us, but we just don't know very much about it and they certainly don't want to interact with us very much uh, at all. Now, if you read the cases of interactions, there are many cases of them saving people in national parks. You can read Rusty Wilson's books, who's someone I've corresponded with, who collected a lot of stories from, he's a fly fisherman from Colorado, collects stories from rangers and people who take his fly fishing expeditions. And people have been saved by Sasquatch. They've broken bone, you know, fallen on a trail and they've been rescued by Sasquatch. People have been carried down, back to, down the trail to safety. Uh, I heard a case in the Yakima Sasquatch Conference a couple months ago of uh, uh, a Yakima woman that said, you know, she was riding her horse as a younger person and her horse kicked up a mm. hornet's nest and the horse bolted, she got thrown off, she got stunned, she went unconscious and all of a sudden she felt something big and hairy carrying her back to her grandfather's house. They knew where she lived. And when it got there, it honked the horn and left her. <laughs> and I've heard this type of story from other people, people falling off horses and so forth, something big and hairy carried them down the trail. Uh, kids being rescued in Glacier National Park, falling in streams, something big and hairy, pulled them out and shook them off and left them there and stuff. So there are a lot of cases of them saving people, uh, hunters and other people in very remote locations who probably would have perished. There's also hostile encounters where you go into their territory deep, you know, back in Yellowstone or Glacier places like this where they don't watch you and they can be really hostile too. So you get a whole range of behaviors, just like with people. <laughs> So uh, uh, there's just a wide range of behaviors and we should just take it, it should be taken seriously and I think it's more important to talk about this more than keeping it quiet. We could start with the National Park Service, National Forest Service, they could share what they know. I mean, we're the ones paying for it. So uh, this was just from the Montana Con conference last fall. Um, this is a particularly good author I like. I met uh, Rob Alley in Forks. He's documented, he does the illustrations himself for his books. These are all cases from the Northwest Coast up to Alaska, and he's documented a lot of cases of Sasquatch swimming and fishing and swimming out there and getting stuff from the bottom of, of the inlets and bays there along the Northwest Coast. And we know that apes don't swim. So it even more removes it from the idea that this is a relic primate. But this is a good source of books if you want to read really nice condensed stories about Sasquatch with really cool illustrations, you know, they're like grabbing your car and stuff. So this is a movie I saw a couple years ago. This is now available for free on YouTube. You can go home and watch this right now. I had a friend just watch it yesterday. He thought he really liked it. This is just witnesses like I've described to you. And this is the one that I, they asked me to be in to describe some of my ideas about it that came out in December. And uh, again, you can find that on Amazon. And it just has many cases of witnesses seeing really strange things, people who didn't believe in this from the Northwest who saw the Sasquatch turn into orbs for real. 
they couldn't believe it either. People that saw them, but when they looked at the film, it was just like that shimmering predator effect. Sort of invisible, but kind of shimmering. A lot of really good cases in this. And uh, we filmed the section I was in over at WCU and at Idler's Rest. So you might enjoy that if this topic is curious to you. Interesting. So any questions? Thanks for listening. And any questions at all? Yes, sir, in the back. Do you have any theories about why no, no skeletons or archaeological remains have ever been found? Yeah, so there's a couple answers to that. You do read, like in Dave Pilates' books, of bones of giants being found over and over again for the past 150 years, especially in the Southwest, where they'd be preserved longer. They always end up at the Smithsonian, and the Smithsonian always says, we don't know where they went. So there's one idea that when they're found, they disappear. And I've read cases of archaeologists coming across this and like in national park areas and stuff, and they're told, look, we don't want we don't want this type of publicity, just get rid of them. The other idea, it's a really, the other idea is it's kind of mysterious, isn't it? But we don't often find bones of really, really big animals very often in the woods. I mean, they, they usually, you know, they disappear within a matter of weeks. But it's definitely a good question. So one angle is the conspiracy idea that, the, you know, someone's taking care of it. And the other idea is we don't really know exactly. But it's, it's something we're curious about. Yeah. How do you know the ones on all fours if you don't? That's a good question. I'm glad you brought that up. One of the stranger aspects of this is when people describe being chased by these things or them running after them, they can go down on all fours and be really fast and then go back up on two legs. So they can switch between two and four legs really easily. And this is what makes it confusing for people. They thought they were looking, you know, maybe at a really big bear and then it's running on all fours, but it looks like a caveman and it's up on two legs. I interviewed someone like this. You can hear it on my YouTube channel. It was a radio show talk show host, for Gary Anderson. Uh, he went up to British Columbia just on a weekend to take photos with a friend and they went to one of these former Japanese prisoner of war camps where, you know, the camp still exists from World War II. And they were only there a minute where something did not like them being there. They th first thought it was a bear until it screamed and he dropped his camera equipment. He says it's probably still there. And they ran for the car. Uh, and uh, he said that went down on fours, up on two legs. It was really disconcerting. There was some damage to the car. It threw something at the car. And uh, the insurance covered it. They said it was something hit the car. But anyway, it, uh, there's a range of experiences. You talk to some people, they say, I never want to see anything like that again. A lot of people don't even want to go out in the woods again uh, after experiencing this because they're just too shaken up. I mean, I had a friend who encountered this after I started working on the book who lived in Arizona. And, and she didn't go outside hiking for a year. Um, she drew what she saw out her window, looked like that, in, in northern Arizona at her family's uh, you know, vacation condo. Six feet. And she didn't believe in this, by the way. She thought I was full of it when we had a talk a couple weeks later. This is what she encountered. She said it was six feet tall squatting <laughs> in a squatting position. And that she's an artist, and that's sort of what it looked like, sort of human and sort of like something else, you know, very long arms. She said when it stood up, it was more like 12 feet, and uh, uh, they didn't go back there for quite a while. Uh, so people can get really intimidated by this. But anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to answer, young man, I didn't mean to answer your question in such a long way. But there's two legs, four legs. And... Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Obviously, they reproduce. Yeah. And if they're so scattered, how is this happening? I mean, you know, That's a really good question. Like, they find each other, or they take two, you know. So I remember reading a story of a woman that lived near the Dvorak Reservoir, at, near Orfino, and she said that they would see them strolling out there, the whole family of them, the young ones, the bigger ones. They had binoculars. They could see them up on a mountain all the time roaming around out there. You know, a lot of these people don't share their encounters. You probably know people like this because they feel it's like a special thing to have Sasquatch in your neighborhood. If you read uh, Becky Cook's books, Bigfoot Still Lives in Idaho, she's a reporter from 
uh, Idaho Falls who got interested in this topic and she started collecting stories from hunters and other people. She said they're just all over the state and when you read the stories the people feel like it's sort of special to have a Sasquatch in your backyard if they're kind of like non-hostile. It's kind of cool to have them around so you don't tell anybody because you don't want anyone else coming in there. You'll see them once in a while. So people see, I'm, I'm answering your question this way, people see them in family groups. And this is something I wonder about all the time. When I first started hearing about this 20, 30 years ago, it just seemed like some rare animal. And there may be like a thousand in the U.S. And you kind of wonder they're probably clustered in the Cascades, you know, the, out towards the West Coast there. But that's not what it turned out to be. They turned out to be everywhere. <laughs> Uh, and the more I read about it, I just heard an interview of someone that saw them on Long Island. And I'm originally from New York way back in. This, you think They're actually seen in Delaware and Rhode Island and all these places. But that's a really good question. We see them with juveniles. People can tell they're juveniles, like that case from Moscow Mountain where they, they thought it was just a big chimp. And he thought later it was a Sasquatch juvenile. Yeah, they, they have uh, family structures. And this seems to be why they're so protective and occasionally hostile is you're coming to an area where they have their families and they're very protective of their young and will, if you are around their young, they will behave like you would behave around your kids too. I mean, protecting them, they're very aggressive. But uh, we don't know how many there are. We don't know how long do they live and what are the population densities? How do they reproduce? Are they in breeding? I'm pretty sure they're extinct. Right. Now, this is a good question because Paul Freeman, his son, when he talked about his dad's experience, said that they knew six or seven by name almost out in that area. They thought they knew that one that he filmed from the tracks. They would just see the same tracks over and over, and they said, these are female prints, these are male, and these are kids. And they thought they knew that there were like a certain number right around that area and that the one that his dad filmed was one that they'd seen the tracks for years uh, before. So it's a really good question. And something we, we don't have a lot of answers here, unfortunately. Yes. How many you've given a good documentation of the ones that you think are real? How many fakes though are you aware of? Oh, I'm sure they they exist. People, I mean, we see them every once in a while. Paper people make a flash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big yeah. foot and go out and stomp around a campground. The thing about some of these tracks that people find, they are in the most remote location, and you just wouldn't think someone would spend all that time hoaxing and then uh, go out in the most remote location where, uh, you know, you, they would never be found, those prints. And here's the thing about a lot of these prints. They have dermal ridges and, like, the so-called metatarsal break. I mean, really fine, detailed aspects of mammalian anatomy. Yeah, you just, I, I, I can't really see anyone faking dermal ridges. I mean, that's microscopic. So when you look at the prints and look at them really finely, people think that the vast majority of them, there's some, probably some fakes, no doubt about it. I mean, you're going to find this even in artwork or anywhere. There are going to be fakes here and there. But for the most part, they seem to be genuine just, uh, you know, from the detail in the foot structure in the cast. Uh, but uh, I think I would say for the most part, what I've looked at, they seem genuine. If they look too even and, you know, and the toes are all the same, that's probably not a real cast. So. Well, people see ghosts all the time. There's many more examples of people seeing ghosts. Lots of houses, people claim that they're there, they hear the noise, they hear yes. the sound. They do. So they have to be paranormal, almost. Uh, yeah, this is why people think that there's a paranormal aspect to Sasquatch. To me, it's just another level of science that we don't understand yet. And paranormal is sort of saying, well, we don't really, you know. I actually think there's too many, because you mentioned ghosts. What do people report around ghost sightings? Sudden cold orbs. It's sort of the same thing that you see around Sasquatch. And that leads me to believe that there's some similarities between these phenomena. In other words, there's just a level of reality we can't physically see like dark matter, but it's there. And occasionally it sort of comes into our reality too. But honestly, I can't totally make sense of it either. I have more questions than answers. Yeah. What do you just say or we think? What do you think we see? Is the Yeti and all the same family? I would say so, because these are seen in every country, pretty much. You hear reports from the soldiers. Our soldiers that were in Afghanistan, they had... Uh, reports of these creatures over there. The Taliban there had a name for them. They didn't like them. They referred to them as giants. Kandahar giants. Kandahar giants. And 
Same thing, the glowing eyes, they could actually see their infrared scopes, which no mammals can see that type of infrared, but these creatures, the Kandahar giants could like, they could see something that isn't supposed to be invisible light range. So I would say, I read about them in the UK, in Germany. I mean, I don't think there's anywhere where they don't exist. It's really quite a mystery, isn't it? But I would say the Yeti, abominable snowman, is in the same family. I, I think you'd have to conclude, if this data is all real, if it's what we, I think it is and other researchers, there's a lot of different species of Yeti, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, even in North America, because there's so much variation in how they look from more ape-like to more caveman-like to more cat-like. Uh, even groups of people that see, now this is strange, even a group of hikers, four or five, that see the same one won't have the same description of it. So, um, yeah, I think they're all the same sort of creature, but with, a, you know, many millennia of evolution that they branched out. In the same way, there's many different types of humans across the planet. There's, you know, on different continents, there's different types of Sasquatch, too. It's really interesting to me how the fear distorts so much of sometimes seeing and hearing and how that might get shifted. I think so. And it's very hard to talk about. Again, the ridicule factor comes in. Uh, you know, people that go out on a limb to study this, it's not really going to help your prospects for getting grants <laughs> and getting promoted. I mean, you, people in academia think about those things. They think about tenure, right? They think about grants. That's huge for any scientist. That's your lifeblood or grants from NSF and different government agencies. And if you talk about this, it's like being against fluoridated water. Okay, you're going to be criticized immediately, even though there's a lot of science to support what you're saying. You can't have an honest discussion about it. We have not had an honest discussion about Sasquatch in this country yet, as far as I'm concerned. So eventually, I think it's good. Whether you believe what I presented or not, whether you're a skeptic, it doesn't matter. Eventually, we're going to have to have a discussion because people are encountering this, and it's frightening them, and they're, they don't want to go out in the woods again. And I think because of the Internet, YouTube, you know, social media, we can share this information. And the more I share this, the more I have people share stories with me, like Barbara's story, you know, which you say, wow, and this person, they've never told that to anyone before. So I think there's a lot more witnesses to come forward and a lot more information. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, Bigfoot's not just in the United States, it's everywhere? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I mean, definitely Bigfoot's in Canada, and there's just different names for Bigfoot throughout the world, but the behaviors of it seem very similar, so as hard to believe as it is, it seems, my view on it is there's another type of human that coexists with us that we're not very familiar with, which seems almost unbelievable given the impact we have on our planet. And that we think we've seen everything and we have satellites and Google Earth. Like, we don't think there's anything out there we haven't seen. And yet, this seems to suggest there's another type of ancient human that, uh, in my view, that has abilities that we don't have or don't know we have that's been around us and is so elusive. You know, we just have this feeling in this age we live in that everything that exists we would know about by now. We're even having hearings on UFOs, UAP, and Congress. That's on the news. Yeah, finally. Yeah, so that's being discussed as it's something real. But the Sasquatch cryptid, there are other types of cryptids out there too that people experience, and we don't even know what to call those. Uh, Stan Gordon, I asked him about this, he thinks they're variants of Sasquatch. Like Bigfoot has all these variants that look more dog-like, more cat-like. Nobody knows. There are really no experts in Sasquatch. I'm certainly not one either. We're just doing our best to look at the evidence and kind of reach a conclusion. But uh, I sort of wonder whether there's a government vault somewhere where they know more about this since the government <laughs> administers so much land, whether it's BLM or National Forest Service, right, or yeah. National Parks, so maybe someone does know more about it. Yeah? So I hear you talking about dark matter. What do you think about dimensionally more? <coughs> dimensionally? Going back and forth. Yeah. Dimensionally. It seems that that's what they're doing. It's hard to it's understand. It's like the UFO thing. Yeah, because Why people... Why don't we see them all the time? Right, they're exactly. Yes, yeah, something like that. They seem to be moving into another space. People have seen the footprints 
without any creature there. I mean, you read these reports of hikers saying something really big came by them. They heard it. They felt you can feel the, the ground moving, but they couldn't see anything. So it's like they're there, but they're not visible. And then another stage would be where they sort of, they're in another dimension in the same space time we're in, but we can't interact with them directly. I mean, I think that's what it points to as mentally challenging as that is to accept. Something like that, yeah. What do you think about minds? Oh, thanks. Have you dove into that? Yeah, this is one of the reasons I got, thanks for asking that. One of the people I met early on in Colorado had told me about this encounter in her house when she saw one in her mind's eye and then she heard the howl and she didn't know what was going on, but her friend in the kitchen downstairs saw the exact Sasquatch through the French doors near Colorado Springs. And it was exactly like she had seen in her mind's eye. So a lot of people talk about this mind speak, and sometimes this precedes a physical encounter by a couple days or a couple weeks. As people in remote locations camping or something will start hearing a voice speaking in their mind that, you know, sounds intelligent, but they don't know where it's coming from before they meet the Sasquatch. So the Sasquatch do seem to have this ability to broadcast into your mind, however they do it. Again, with this theme of directed energy, something like that. And people have described it as a muddy sounding voice. Sometimes where it's told them on a trail to go this way, not that way and help them or trick them, go this way when they shouldn't go on that way. You get both. Yeah. And then other people have described it as a kind of a mechanical computer sounding voice. So what I'm not sure is, is that the way their voice sounds or is that how your brain is interpreting it? <laughs> Going back to one, someone's question. We don't know exactly, but yeah, the mind speak telepathic aspect is a, pretty big component of it that you may know people have experienced this so yeah what do you think of this i'm not sure what's the question <laughs> todd standing up in canada i mean i've looked i've watched his videos some of it looks like the real deal of them going up those slopes faster than any human uh if you've heard stories about how fast they can climb someone was telling me about some people he knew that were hunting elk in Riggins and they this thing went like straight up you know steep Riggins area they just went they couldn't catch up to it even with their vehicle with the switchback it was straight up and Todd standing has some video that looks like that but I, I'm not sure I have to say it's like a gray zone for me this stuff it, it could be real I just you know I'm not sure one way or another anything else Simon, why don't we uh, yes. we'll officially close the, Sounds good. the meeting, except you're here for answering. Or yes, if anyone wants to uh, oh, yes. get a book signed or just take a look, I've got bookmarks there. You're welcome to take a bookmark. You're welcome to come up and talk, share any stories. But thank you very much, David. This was a lot of fun. Thanks okay, for well, it's fun of you. Now we move into the social aspect. You can come up and talk to people, sure. talk to your neighbors. We have refreshments in the back room. Uh, if you haven't signed in, make sure you sign in.